Hello everybody and welcome to the Creative Cloud Workshop video recordings hosted by Keyline, the Digital Design College. We have been shaping design workflows in KZN for almost the last two decades. We offer courses in graphic and web design, video production, 3D modeling, and much more. We're located on the Florida Road Strip in Durban. So the next time you're around, give us a shout and we'll be happy to show you around and assist you with solutions to whatever you're trying to create. Today, we'll be going over some tips and techniques in Adobe Illustrator. We all know Adobe Illustrator. It's our go-to for any vector graphic creation. Let's see what we can do that's a little bit different. We'll start off basic. I'm gonna start off with the shape tools. Yeah, now you're thinking, hmm, shapes. What could be new with shapes? They've actually given them a little bit of a facelift. Let's have a look at what I'm talking about. I've got a nice little square here on my screen. I'll grab my selection tool. The new thing is this little circle right over here. That's a corner node. I can go ahead and click on that, hold, pull, to create a corner radius. Now, of course, you'll see that as I do this, that affects all four corners. If I wanted to just affect one corner, I'll go ahead and select it once, and then click hold and make the change. Lovely, there's my shape. With that selected, you'll see that on the right-hand side of my screen, I have this properties palette constantly open. The properties palette actually does a lot of my customization and performs a lot of my features for me. Let's have a look. With my new shape selected through the properties panel, I get some transform options, X and Y positioning, rotations, width and height. If I click on the ellipse on the bottom here, that will show me some more options. From right down there, I can control those corners. We see that I have a radius of about 20 on those three sides and zero on the top. Even though I made those changes live on my shape, through here, I'm getting those exact values. Of course, I'm also getting some appearance values through that properties panel. All right, let's go ahead and play with the next shape the rounded rectangle. Of course, now with the rectangle, pulling that corner node makes it a rounded rectangle. If I hold the Alt key before clicking on one of those nodes, aha, I get the ability to toggle or cycle between the different corner options. Let's move over to the circle next. Circle selected and no corners on a circle. So that's gonna be a little bit different. I still have that little circle controller there. If I click, hold and pull on that, instead of creating a rounded edge, instead, what I'm doing is creating a little pie slice. Hey, instant Pac-Man. Now once more, although I'm doing these changes on my shapes live through the properties panel, if I click on the more options, those settings are actually right in here. I get my pi start angle, pi end angle, and so on. Being creatives, yeah, sure, it's fantastic to be able to work with numbers and figures, but sometimes I like the ability to just go ahead and play with the shape, see that change visually. Let's move over to the next shape here. I've got a triangle, all right? And yes, that does have a little circle node. Triangles do have corners, so I can edit those corners like so. The other thing that's been added here is this little diamond node. That diamond actually controls my number of sides. Now, previously, after drawing a shape, we can change the number of sides. Now, this is live. I click and hold on that diamond, and as I move my mouse up or down, I can increase or decrease the number of sides. Of course, once more, 
through my properties panel, clicking on the more options gives me the same options. Nice little slider here, and that's a very nice touch. Also notice how all of those changes are live. Let's continue along working with paths. So I have a nice little shape here, right? Little squiggles. And yeah, we all know how to use the pen tool and how to make these nice little Bezier curves. But a way to do this a little bit quicker, instead of the pen tool, right next to it, my curvature tool that will allow me to place a point. I'll move across to my next point and click. What this actually does for me, we're seeing through those blue controllers, that's giving me natural curves. I'm not clicking, I'm not, I'm not holding my mouse down. Simply moving around and placing points on my screen and those pods are connected nice and curved like so. All right, so we've got these nice two shapes over here, great. And well, they're disconnected. If I want to be able to put some color in there or make them hold a graphic, we all know that needs to be a closed shape. So in the past, what would we do? Select both, go over and join them. Object, path, join, or command J. Here's my first join. I'll do a command J shortcut this time. And there's my second join. Cool, great, that works. The problem with this, however, is that was supposed to be a fish and it ends up looking like a wine glass after one too many sideways. Instead, I'll undo those two changes, go ahead and access my join tool. Yeah, there's a dedicated tool for this now. So no longer command J unless I want straight lines. See what the join tool does is it allows those curves to continue. I'll go ahead and just click hold and drag across these two. It extends them to the point at which they would naturally join. I'll do the same for the tail over here. The result is much cleaner. All right, I'm gonna just jump across to another document here that I have open in a separate tab. Nice typical document, a typical CI or brand guide, cat's eye detective agency. What we're going to be looking at here is we'll be exploring this guy that I've been talking about, the properties panel. We saw how when I have a shape selected, I'm able to look at its full stroke and edit those, as well as the transform values. The change comes in when I have nothing selected. I'll just click on the side of my pasteboard here. Properties panel first tells me that I have no selection. And then on the top, I get some document options. Firstly, the ability to control my units of measurement. This happens to me so often. I create a document really quickly and I leave it in inches. Who works in inches? I'll go ahead and click on that change my document to millimeters. That actually updates my numerical fields for me. So now when I try to transform something, move something, or even place a guide, I'm working in millimeters. The second option that I have here is the ability to view my artboards. Now sure, it's easy enough to zoom in and start navigating to artboards. From here, if I go ahead and just click on this little arrow to go over to artboard two, it not only takes me to Artboard 2, it does a little command zero, a fit to window. Similarly for three, four, five, six, and so on. As I cycle through those artboards, I get to view the entire page on my screen. Let's go ahead and bring ourselves back over to the first artboard. The next little button I have is edit artboards. I'll go ahead and click on that. That activates my artboard tool. I was on the selection tool, it's jumped me across. I can use normal functionality of the tool, as well as change a selected page, X and Y position, width and height, give it a name, preset, change its orientation, and so on. What I'm interested in, however, I'll just view all of my artboards here. 
is the ability to rearrange all. Let me click on that button. Now, this allows me to control the layout of my page. Of course, this is the layout for how this document will print or the layout for when I create a PDF. So it's pretty important to make sure that everything's in order here. We can see that as per this little icon here, my pages go across, then down and back across. If I wanted them to instead go across my screen from left to right, I'll go ahead and choose that option. That's the horizontal arrow. Of course, making sure that I'm moving my artwork with my artboard so that artwork isn't just randomly left on the pasteboard. I'll click on OK. Here we have it. My document's now updated. My pages are running from left to right. I'll go in there one more time, rearrange all. I also have the ability to control the spacing between my artboards in case I need just a little bit more pasteboard on the side of my artboards. Let's increase that up to 30. OK. And now I get more space right there. Let's go ahead and exit the artboard editing. Like so. I also have little buttons for guides, rulers, right here. Instead of going over to the menu, I can drag on a guide like so. And as I'm dragging those on, well, they're disappearing. Cool. Instead of going to try and show or hide guides, that's my next section down here. My guides are currently hidden. Clicking on that button allows me to show my guides. From here, I can also lock them or show and hide my smart guides. I can do the same thing for snapping. Some of my quick options for transforming are here as well. The ability to scale my corners, strokes and effects. And if I use my arrow keys to nudge elements, I can also control my keyboard increment. So every time I move something with an arrow, at the moment, it moves by 0.3 millimeters. Right on the bottom of this, I have some quick actions. That gives me the ability to jump over to the document setup area in case I forgot to add some bleed or jump across to my preferences if I need to change how the program works. This properties panel is dynamic. It updates depending on what you have selected as well as what tool you have active. I'm just gonna jump myself over to Artboard 1 and let's see this properties panel update. I'll select this little lightning bolt, great. Now I'm getting full in stroke attributes, a line, and my quick actions have all changed. I'm interested in this one down here. This may be something that you haven't played with yet. This has been out for a good two years already. The global edit. Now what it does is it allows me to edit multiple objects globally in one step. Of course, it comes in handy in situations when multiple copies of an object, like a logo, are present in a document. You can imagine trying to manually find and manually edit all of those logos would be a pain and could also result in a few errors. So with my lightning bolt selected, I'll start a global edit. As I do that, you see that the other lightning bolts get a little blue line across them. Move across to other artboards, same thing going on there. All right, so like the name suggests, the global edit is scanning the entire globe, or in this case, my entire document, to find similar objects. With them all selected, let's just go ahead and change that full color. I can do that from my control bar on the top here, or through my properties panel, there's my full. Let's make that yellow. I'll remove that stroke as well. As I selected that, great. That went ahead and updated that across this artboard. I'll zoom out. Aha. Uh -huh. It's also done it across all of my artboards. Go figure, it even found the tiny little one on this pen over here. All right, and it's made that change for me. Definitely a handy feature, this one. All right, let's jump over to another new feature. I'll jump back over to my initial document. And I have this nice bird over here. Interesting little graphic, I'm sure, as we were working earlier, it caught your eye. 
As we look at it, however, these colors, they actually blend quite nicely, almost like nothing we've seen before in Illustrator. We're used to using things like gradients, and those work either linear in a straight line or radial from the center. But this is doing something different. I'll go ahead and select one part of this bird. Of course, this being a group, I'll just double click to isolate. All right, and I have this main body of the bird selected. Through my properties panel, I'm not seeing any gradient functionality. In order to do so, I'll need to activate my gradient tool by simply pressing G on my keyboard. Now my gradient types have popped up. I can set that to a linear. Like we said in a straight line, radial that radiates from the center out. I'm interested in this third option. That's the free form gradient. The free form gradient allows me to place key points on a shape that can hold color. I'll double click on one of these points and I have the ability to change that color. What's important here is if you look in this area right over here, it's creating that blend for me, as well as a blend right here. Let's change that color as well. Double click. Let's go ahead and make that quite bright, nice, gentle blends with my free form gradient. Now these points also give me the ability to not just change their color, but move them around. And as I move them around, my color and blends also update. So I can move that around till I'm happy with the type of color blend that I'm getting. I can also select one of those color stops and with the circular node on the outside of it, I can increase or decrease that color's spread. All right, now I see we've got a question there in the chat about is the freeform gradient limited to three points? Nice one. I have three at the moment. If I wanted an extra point, I'll simply hover in a blank area, click once. There's my fourth. I can do a fifth, sixth, and seventh if I wanted to. And we can keep going. Of course, being able to create a nice subtle blend, we'd want not too many colors. That might make it hard for them to blend in nicely. If I want to remove a point, I simply select it and hit the backspace key on my keyboard. So right now, using the freeform gradient tool, we've added points, we've moved points, changed their color as well as their spread. We're working with points. I'll grab my selection tool, get out of isolation mode, double click on the side here, and let's go ahead and do the same thing with the segment of wing. I'll double click, like so. Gradient tool or shortcut G, change the type to freeform. And great, I've already got some points in here. It's a blue one there, and I'll just put another one here. All right, let's make that, uh, maybe let's go into a green on the side. I'll select this point and then change myself over. Instead of working with points, I have the ability to work with lines. Switch over to lines. From this point, I can move across and place a line right there, a line up here, and a line down there. Just like the freeform tool that we saw earlier, the curvature tool, this is allowing me to place those points and I'm getting nice little curves, double click, and I can start editing those. I've added an extra point there. There we go, a quick undo to undo that. I'll double click on this point and I can start adding colors. I'll go with some darker shades here, like so. Let's get a bit of a purple going on there. All right, and I'll leave that as white. And now I have my freeform points going over the top and my freeform lines going over the bottom. The result is a nice little shadowy area on the bottom. Great. Let's jump out of isolation. Great. So I've got this bird, birds ready, nice and colored in. But I want to move him around. So I want to be able to move maybe that tail or that head without moving the entire shape. 
That's where the puppet walk tool comes into play. Now, funny story about that tool. I had this buddy of mine who's crazy about surfing and decided to open up his own surf shop. He came across to me, of course, being learned in the Adobe arts, he wanted to create his own little logo. So he came across and he said, hmm, he's grabbed his polygon tool, drawn a little triangle, and that looks cool, and maybe he made that a nice shade of gray. It looks cool, it's almost ready. Let's move that onto the page, there we go. It's almost ready, but it doesn't really look like a shark fin, just a, a random triangle. He might just be selling pyramids. So I told him, okay, here's this tool that I've been itching to try out. It's called the Puppet Warp, grouped with my free transform. And as soon as I activate it, you see my screen change. What that does is it creates key points or pins on my shape, and it joins those pins by this mesh geometry. I can select one of these key areas or pins, and when I move it, in almost like a liquefy fashion, that point moves, the pins keep those other edges in place, and well, I can just go ahead and give him a little shock thing. Quick and easy. Of course, if I want to add more pins, just like with my freeform gradient, I'll go ahead and click on one, like so, to add a pin, to remove it, select it, and backspace. All right, and there he had it. Cool, instant shock fin. Let me remove that, select my bird, and let's repeat this process, instead of with a single object, with a group. So I've got this fish, and this fish is, yeah, swimming around. I've got a bird flying overhead and it catches the bird's eye. Let's go ahead and place some pins on this guy. A nice one on the head here. As soon as that bird sees his prey, he'll drop his tail. Something interesting there. Gives him more of an aerial advantage. Go ahead and drop that head slightly. And what that does is puts him in attack mode. Angry bird or hungry bird. He's seen his fish and ready to attack. So this object has become a puppet. Those pins allow me to place key areas, whether those are limbs or little joints, and then move them around. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and create a new object for myself here. I'll just grab a little ellipse tool. All right, and let's start creating something. I'll give myself a little circle here. Let's zoom in on that. And what I want to do is actually get this circle repeating. So I want four of them repeating around a central point. I'll grab my rotate tool and I get this little icon up here. That's my anchor. I'll place that at this bottom point right here. Now, as I rotate, I grab this from an outer point and start moving it. You see that that bottom point is held in place. I'll hold the shift key to just snap that to 45 degrees. I want 90. Hold the Alt for a copy and let go. Lovely. That's created a second one, rotated 90 degrees for me. And as we all know, Illustrator gives us the ability to repeat our last transformation. Object, transform and transform again, or Command D. That'll go ahead and give me a third and fourth circle. Lovely. Four circles, nicely set up on top of each other. And how Illustrator works, what we're used to is select a circle, and that one can hold its own color. Similarly, this one can hold its own color. What I wanna be able to do, as I hover over these circles, see these little overlapping areas? I wanna give them their own color. Instead of using a pathfinder and trying to divide them, I'll just go ahead and select my objects, and bring up my Live Paint Bucket tool. Grouped right here with my Shape Builder is the Live Paint Bucket. And in order for this to work, my object must be a Live Paint group. Now, before I do that, let me remove that stroke. Still selected and I can still see it, so that's okay. I'll go ahead and grab that Live Paint Bucket. 
And as I hover over here, it tells me my first click will make a live paint group. Great. Click once to apply it. And that actually breaks this up for me into little segments and sections that I can quickly drop color into via my swatches, choose a color, place it, use my arrows to toggle between those swatches. And just drop in some color. Instead of me having to split this shape up, all I'm doing is using my live paint bucket to isolate those areas and give them their own color. Now, once I've done this, if I do isolate one of those shapes, I'll go ahead and do that with this pink one here and move it around. It still keeps those colors and updates as I move it. If, however, we get a little bit too carried away and we move that out of the area and back in, well, we've sort of broken that connection. So that's not going to remember the color it was supposed to be. I'll just undo that so it looks pretty again. Another thing that I use very, very often are clipping masks. Clipping masks are actually integral to my workflow. The problem with them, however, is let me go ahead and just get a few assets onto the screen here. I'll open up my symbols palette, browse through the library. Ah, oh, fashion, cool. Let's bring on that t-shirt. Make that nice and large. And this being a symbol, if I want to be able to edit its color, I'll just go ahead and break its link to that symbol. Change the color. I'll bring about a few more symbols here. Let's go into the Florid Vector Pack. Oh, that looks cool. Drag that onto my shirt. Huge. Make that just a tad smaller. <clears throat> Lovely. So I have this element on my screen, on my shirt. I'll create a copy of it. I'll just grab my Reflect tool. Place my anchor. Grab it from an outer point. Or actually this time, what I'll do is I'll hold the Alt key and click on my anchor. Right there, there we go. Let's turn the preview on. Yeah, that looks great at a 90 degree reflection. Let's make a copy of it. All right, so I've got my two and to make a clipping mask, great, let's go over the usual steps. Bring the shirt to the front. Select all three elements, object, clipping mask, make, or command set. So that's worked. I've got my clipping mask made. The objects outside the t-shirt have been clipped out, but I lose my color. And that's been a problem that we've just dealt with for very long. I'll undo that. Instead, I'll select these two little graphic elements and cut them. Command X. Those go over into my clipboard. Select that t-shirt and I'll change my drawing mode. Right on the bottom of my toolbar here, I have three drawing modes, normal, which means every new object I draw is in front of the last one. The, the ability to draw behind, so every new object is drawn behind the previous one, or the ability to draw inside. Draw inside, nice little area here to show me where my clip will be. And I'll just paste that in place. The most important step here, of course, switching back to draw normal. Otherwise, my next drawing will try to go inside the t-shirt too. And just like that, I'm able to keep that color as well as create the clipping mask. All right, let me go ahead and just create a new artboard for myself here. I'll do that from the properties palette. Right here, I'll click on edit artboards, a little plus symbol, and there's my artboard. Now, I do have the ability here to pull up those sides to create that artboard at whatever size I need it to be. 
Of course, if I'm working with exact figures, I'll use my width and height. All right. Sometimes while I'm working, I've got this idea of a ship, but it's stuck inside an image format. Now, of course, I'd have to bring that image in, grab my pen tool and trace around it so that I can use it and change its color and that kind of thing. Let me place an image in here. File, place. I'll go ahead and grab this PSD. So that's a Photoshop document. And I'll click, hold and drag to bring that in at the size that I want to use it. Now note, I'm not holding shift here. Illustrator is actually keeping those proportions for me. Great, there's my image. And this is actually a very high resolution image. If I look up in my control bar, that tells me that the PPI for this image is 375. That's cool if I want to print it. I don't. I want to trace this and just work with sort of like the outline of that shape. So to make the load a little bit easier on my computer, the first thing that I'll do is rasterize it. See, I want to just do an image trace. And if I try to do that right now, Illustrator warns me, it tells me that that may proceed slowly because my image is so large. Instead, rasterize. Let's listen to good old Illustrator. Object, rasterize. I'll keep that color mode as CMYK, but drop the resolution. I don't need it at 300. I'll drop it down to a screen resolution and make my background transparent. If you look at it, there's almost no visual change. So that's good to see. Let's click on image trace. Great, Illustrator's traced this image for me. It's black and white though. I'll click on my tracing panel right here to bring up those trace options. This gives me a little bit of finite control over that tracing. Starting off with a preset, the default made it black and white. I have loads of options in here. I'm just gonna go ahead and give myself a three color trace. Cool. Someone's won the Golden Pineapple Award. Open up my advanced options here. See, I wanna be able to keep an eye on the number of anchors that I'm creating. I'll drop the number of pods. As I do that, that drops those number of anchors. I'll look at my image and make sure that it's not horrible. Dropping the number of pods hasn't removed too much detail. Once I'm happy with that trace, I'll go ahead and expand it into basic shapes. That way, I'll be able to edit it. Bring up my direct selection tool. Great. I can see that I'm getting some editable areas there. Let's isolate this background. I don't actually need that background. I'll remove it. Come out of isolation mode. It's just the golden pineapple that I want to work with, really. All right, so this shape is you know, pretty cool. Something nice for me to work with. Let's create a few repeats. I'll hold the Alt key, pull one across to the side here. Repeat that on the other side. Alt key, pull that over to the side. And I'll give them each a little rotation. One this way and one that way. So three golden pineapples, mm, not that cool. Let's select this one and let's change its color. Instead of trying to isolate areas, choose a swatch. Through my properties panel right here, my quick actions, like we said, will update. I can recolor this. This shows me the current colors that I'm using. I want to edit them, so I'll just switch over to edit. This gives me the ability to, let's just move that out of the way so we can see a live update. As I move one of these sliders, or color stops. Aha, I'm able to change that color on my pineapple. And maybe those whites can, yeah, that looks pretty cool. So I'm using these colors instead. Alternatively, so right now I've chosen colors across each other on that color wheel. If I wanna look at a few variations, but keep that relationship, I'll link my harmony colors. And now as I move one of these, the others update. 
each one giving me cool little variations within that color relationship. And once I'm happy with that, I'll go ahead and hit OK. Actually, let's go ahead and make that more of a blue. OK, great. For my pineapple on this end, I want to go ahead and maybe use a red. So I'll go to my color palette or swatches palette and I'll start off by choosing my red. Now, I'm not sure what colors will work with this. I'll just pull up my color guide. Of course, if you're not seeing that on the side, that's window color guide. Double click on the red here to make sure that it's active. I'll click on this drop down to show me the different harmony rules. I'm actually able to use any of these. See, Illustrator has studied it. I like these split complements, they're pretty cool. So I'll select that, click on my palette menu, and save those colors as swatches. Open up that swatches palette, great. They're right over here, I've got a nice color group. Select my third pineapple, and double click on the folder icon. Now what that does is it dumps those colors onto my shape, opens up that recolor artwork dialog we were in in a second ago. I've still got the ability to edit, but through a sign, what I could also do right down here is choose to randomly change the saturation and brightness or even randomly change the color order. So move the red, green, and blue around. Once I found one that I'm happy with, I can change the saturation and brightness. Oh, that's not bad. I'll click OK and just update that color group of mine. Lovely, there's my three pineapples. Let's go ahead and reuse these, create some more repeats. I'll select all and just drag those into my swatches. And you see that they've been placed right over there. Cool. Before I use those, I'll move those pineapples over onto my pasteboard. Create a little area to hold my background. Like so. Let's just press D for default. That's white. Open up those swatches and apply this. See, what I created by dragging that into the swatches was a pattern, a pattern swatch. Clicking it applies the pattern, and if I need to make a change or edit, I'll double click on that swatch. That takes me into pattern editing. I get my pattern options right here, and I can change the name, the type of tile. Let's go with a hex. I can also, from here, make changes. For example, if I select this pineapple, go right back over to recolor it and change the color order or even that saturation. I'll click OK. It's not just that pineapple that's updated. All of my repeats have two. Once I'm happy with that, I'll hit Done. And there's my nice little background element, the pattern. I'll just go ahead and open up my appearance palette. I'll click on the three dots here to open that up. Lovely. I've got a fill in a stroke. And instead of creating another object, trying to put it behind or give it an opacity, I'll simply go ahead and create a new fill. I've got buttons for it down here. And I can also do that through the palette menu. Add a new fill. I'll go ahead and give that a color. Maybe a nice little gradient, like so. And that gradient covers my entire object. You see objects or appearances within this palette have a stacking order. I'll take that fill, the orange gradient, and move it underneath the pineapple pattern, and there we go. Great, I've now got that gradient behind my pineapples. 
Let's go ahead and decrease the opacity of these pineapples. Now I'm not doing that through the opacity on the bottom here. That's the global opacity for this entire shape. Instead, if I want to just drop the opacity of the pineapples, I'll locate that full, toggle open its settings, and under opacity, I'll decrease its opacity. That decreases the intensity or opacity of the pineapples, leaving the gradient untouched. Now using this, of course, you could have a third and fourth full. You could do the same thing for your strokes as well. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and select my center golden pineapple. And since we were looking at opacity, let's look at what else we can do with that. Bring this over so it's by itself on the side here. I'll just make that a little bit larger. Draw a rectangle over it. And I wanna fill this with a gradient. Properties panel. I'll tap G on my keyboard. Let's just make that a linear gradient. Let's go with the black to white. Fantastic. I'll select both objects. That's my rectangle as well as the pineapple. And I can't see that both are selected. It looks like it's just the one selected. In fact, my properties panel tells me that it's mixed objects, right? So that's how I know that two objects have been selected. And I'll use the shape on top to create an opacity mask. I'll simply click on the word opacity and choose make mask. Now, this works similar to your Photoshop mask. When I look at it, I can see, okay, that worked. I'm getting that sort of opacity going on. In order to edit it, I'll select that mask, pull up my gradient tool, and now moving the black. Remember, just like Photoshop, black will hide. So if I move this closer and, there's, and the black comes in sooner, I'll be hiding more. If I move the white, white shows, I'll be showing more of that pineapple. I can also, with my gradient tool, simply click, hold, and draw in the transition of that gradient. Once I'm done making this change to the mask, I'll go ahead back over to opacity and select the object itself. Now, any change that I make will not be editing the mask, but I can go ahead and move the object into position instead. Let's bring that to the front. So there's a few cool things that I can do with this pineapple. We saw how we could make an opacity mask. We could make a pattern out of it. I'll start off with something else now. Select that pineapple. I'm gonna go over to my brushes palette and using that, I'll click on the plus and choose to make an art brush. I can make an art brush over anything that I've created. I'll click OK. Give that a name if I need to. I can change its direction, but let's not do that right now. We'll leave it as standard and revisit this in a second. I just want to change the colorization so that I'm able to shift the hue. OK grab my brush tool and using this brush, if I click, hold and drag, check that out. I'm able to draw a pineapple. Now notice how when I draw it, well, that's coming in as white. That's because of my stroke color. Remember I chose hue shift. If I choose green here, I can create a nice green pineapple and it shifts those hues for me and so on. So it's not just a pineapple. Now I can create a nice variation of these. Let's do this one more time with a new object. I'll grab my ellipse tool, get myself a nice little ellipse here, select the topmost point And I'm gonna go ahead and convert that point to a corner point. 
Now, as I'm clicking on those little corners, you'll see that I'm unable to select those little anchors. I'll go over to my view menu and choose to show my edges. Right over here. Select this anchor, convert that to a corner. I'll do the same down here. Select my anchor, convert to corner. Lovely, there's my shape. I'll give that a little fill color so that we can uh, see that nicely. And I actually want to put two colors in here. So let's just grab the, let's grab the knife tool. That'll allow me to cut this path into two parts. I'll go ahead and slice that right over here. Holding the Alt key, I can just go ahead and draw a straight line like so. And that's slice those up. Those are actually two little slices now. I'll start off by removing that stroke. I'll give this one its own color. And I'll give this one its own color. Nice little variation there. Select both of them. And instead of having a, an upright leaf, you don't actually find those very often unless you're a brilliant gardener. Let's grab that puppet walk. Move this pin. One in the center here. And if I hover just outside there, instead of moving the pin, I can create a little rotation. I get my leaf to dance a little bit till I'm happy. All right, that one looks cool. And now I'll repeat those steps. Select it, create a new brush. That'll be an art brush. I'll change that over to Hue Shift as well. Okay, and with my brush tool now, as I draw along, I can create little varying leaves. Yeah, sure, they look like leaves. They kind of also look a little bit like, uh, like a herbal aquafresh. Let's see what else I can do with this. I'll just make that leaf a little bit smaller. Great. And we already know how we're able to create little transforms, power transforms as we called them earlier. I can grab my rotate tool, place a point right here, grab that from the outer edge, like so, and repeat that to make a nice little flower. That looks cool. I wanna do this a different way without multiple shapes. See, each one of these is its own shape. And do that. Select my object and I'll go ahead and create an effect here. Effect, distort and transform, and transform. I've got my preview on, so every time I make a change, I should see an update. I'll start off with 10 copies. Now, those 10 copies are directly on top of each other. Let's decrease the scale. So each copy should be 10% well, smaller than the last. I'll go with 90 and 90. And now as I move its positioning, you should see those appearing. I'll just get a little gap between them like so. Maybe give that a little rotation. And as I increase or decrease that angle, you see how that spirals in? or spirals out. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and keep it as this one. That looks pretty cool. I'll press OK. Now the difference here is these other ones are not selectable. They actually don't exist. The only one that's on my page is this. The rest are repeats due to the effect. Where that comes in handy is now, if I wanna go ahead and make a change to this one, example, I make this one a bit smaller, Every single one of the others will update. Similarly, let's just make that slightly smaller. Similarly, if I go ahead and rotate this one shape, the others all update. And I'm just gonna keep going a little bit more. If I ever owned a nature dragon, that's what his tail would look like. So this is a live effect. Any change I make to my one object, great. They will all update. 
And that's using my transform effect to go ahead and create a live transform. So this is a cool little element. Let's zoom out just a bit. I'll go ahead and take that and place that over on my page here. Great, let's put that down here. And let's go ahead and add a little bit of text to this. Grab my type tool and simply click once. I get my placeholder text and I'll go ahead and type in something here. Like we said earlier, well, this is the pineapple award. Because I clicked once, I was able to create a point text box. I can make that larger by just grabbing the corner node. I'm able to make that bigger or smaller. And instead of using a boring font like this, let's have a look at what Illustrator can do to customize those fonts. Double click my word here. I have my character panel up on my control bar, as well as in my properties. Because I have text highlighted and the text tool active, and of course this updated, I'm seeing character options. Let's go ahead and use it up here so I've got some more space. The first thing that's changed is as I hover over any of these fonts, I get a live update here. I also have the ability to see what my word looks like in those fonts. If I wanted to, I can change that to the word typography, any of these phrases. I like that as my selected text. So before I commit to a change, I can go ahead and see what that looks like. Now working with fonts is of course an important part of workflow. We have so many types of fonts. We work with serifs and sans serifs. We work with scripts and decoratives. Sometimes we know that we definitely want to use a sans serif for this body of text. Illustrates has gone ahead and added this little filter area. The icon looks like a little funnel. When I click on that, I'm able to filter fonts so that I can only see my sans serifs, my serifs, my slabs, Maybe I want to see those scripts, old styles or decoratives. Clicking on any of these icons will make my character panel here update. And now I'm only seeing the sans serif fonts. If I don't like my choice, I can go right back in there and choose to filter a different option. Now, as I hover over a font, we see that there's some icons that appear on the end. These two are brand new. The little star over here allows me to choose a font that I use quite often and add it to my favorite list. I'll click on the star. That's something that I like to use. I'll click on the star. And perhaps I use this font very often. I'll click on the star. The next time I come in here, even if I have no filter and I'm browsing all of these fonts, to go ahead and have a look at my favorites, I'll just click on the little star icon on the top. There they are. Let's deactivate that. If I like something about this font, but don't want to use this font in particular, I can click on this little wavy icon that will scan my computer and show me fonts that are similar to that one. It'll go ahead and look at different aspects of the font, whether that's its width, its slant, or even its X height. And it'll go ahead and filter those in and show me fonts that are similar. I can then choose one that I'm happy with. Some of the fonts that I'm browsing here are actually not even installed on my computer. Some of those fonts have this little cloud icon, meaning that they've come over from the creator cloud. They're just active on my account. Right now, I'm browsing all of the fonts that are available on this computer. <clears throat> to find more, I'm able to go over to Adobe fonts and activate others. 
There we go, a whole heap of fonts in this list, and I can simply activate them right here. All right, so I've got my text. Let's go ahead and make that look a little bit cooler. We'll give that a color. Let's go ahead with something nice and impactful. I'll go with a yeah, nice blue. Create a little warp on that text. I can give that a little arc, an arch, bulge, and so on. And yet another thing that I can do with my text, I'll go ahead and type in a word here. Make that nice and large, like so. And I'm gonna change that font. Let's just go over to that character panel and choose something a little bit nicer. Here we go. Great. Zoom in on that. There's another tool that I have to be able to work with these, with my letters. Under my type tool nested in there is my touch type tool. That goes ahead and treats each character as its own individual entity. Using touch type, I can select a character and make that character a little bit larger. Select this other one and make it slightly larger. Maybe give it a slight rotation. I'll do the same to this one in the opposite direction. Great. Maybe shift the baseline here just a little bit. Move that up. Move this one down. And to finish this off, let's just go ahead and draw some pupils for this guy. And give him a little circle in there and a little circle in there. And look, what do we have? In fact, if I look up, I see Jibs, and it looks like he's got something that he wants to say. Okay, so just to go over a couple more things with you guys. So I just want to show you some cool things that Illustrator has built in. Some of you may use them, some of you may not. Hopefully just to make your workflow a little bit more quicker than uh, what it currently is. So let's just go back and look at a little bit of tracing and working with brushes for those of you who are more on the art side and design side are into illustrations. Uh, working with brushes is one of the most important things to allow you to express your creativity no matter what it may be. And sometimes it may be difficult to try and express that if you aren't able to recreate really exactly what you want. So for example, I have this little image over here and uh, what it is, is just a little paint stroke or brush stroke that has been created. Now this was photographed, uh, it's just the image and something and easy to use like that. This you can do it on your own if you want to bring into Illustrator, but what we're gonna turn this into is a brush that you can actually use and paint in in Illustrator itself. And in order to do that, what we're going to do is we're gonna turn this into a vector object. And the easiest way to do that is bring the image in. Let's go to our properties panel. Right at the bottom, we have a little button that's called image trace. We're gonna go ahead and hit that. And for now, I'm just gonna go with a very simple black and white logo version of it. And just to give me a simple little outline like so. Now, whenever you work with any sort of tracing and anything like that, uh, you have multiple presets that you can go between. So if you're not getting the result that you want on the first try, go ahead and try some, others, uh, some other variations of these to see if you get a better end result. Now, once you've got a trace done, we're gonna go ahead and expand. And we're gonna go ungroup to get rid of this white background. So I'm go ahead and select that white background and trash it. Now, one of the downsides of obviously working with traces, if you ever have, is these number of anchor points that it generates. And for any of you who have ever had to draw something like this before, painted or created elements with this many anchor points, you have noticed the more and more you use, the slower and slower the process or your computer becomes. So one of the cool new features that we've added into Illustrator is the ability to simplify the number of anchor points you have automatically. So instead of you going in, finding anchor points and removing them, we now have a brand new simplify path engine built into Illustrator. To access that, you can go into your objects panel, path and simplify. What the new engine shows you is a simple sliding box like this. It'll give you an option whether you're trying to go for smoother or more detail. And as you make adjustments, you'll see two things happen. Firstly, a feedback as to how many anchor points it's currently using. 
And secondly, obviously the preview in the back. Now, if you don't know which one to go between, it also has a little button here that will do the thinking for you by simply hitting auto simplify. All right, so this goes down from a 93 point object all the way down to 73, making life a lot more easier and lighter on the computer itself. Again, based on what you have, you can either go even further down and when you find a happy medium, you can stop there. With the simplified dialog box, if you want even more control, apart from this little controller over here, you can click these three little dots over here, taking us back to the expanded palette that gives us a lot more control and a lot more options to go between. But for now, this is perfectly fine for me. I'm just gonna go ahead and click okay. Next, I'm gonna go ahead and take this guy and turn it into a little brush to work with. So I wanna be able to paint with it. And in order to do that, I'm gonna pop open my brushes panel here on the side. And to turn this into a brush, very simple. Simply make sure the graphic is selected or even easier, just drag into the palette. You'll get a dialog box asking us what type of brush I wanna create. I wanna go with an art brush, which allows me to go ahead and paint. I'm gonna click okay over there. Got this little palette over here. Now, one of the most important things whenever using the art brush is to watch the direction of the arrow. Right, so basically the arrow direction here will dictate where the start point and end point of every stroke uh, is gonna be. So if you look at this, we see the arrow is pointing to the end here. So this is matching up to the tail end of the brush stroke. So when I paint, this will be the first point and this will be the last point. If it's in the opposite direction, then I'll be painting in reverse. So depending on the type of output you want, you can always toggle between these, but you can try them out when you're working with it. If you want to have the ability to change the color of this element, and this one here is a simple black, we're gonna make sure that we use the hue shift method, yeah? So we're not only just gonna be painting backstrokes, if we want to choose to change the colors using our stroke value, this will allow us to do that. Go ahead and click okay. And that's now given me the brush stroke over here. I'm gonna go ahead and keep this guy aside. I've got that there, grab my, paintbrush tool from the top left over here and go ahead and paint out a simple stroke like so. Now, I'm not gonna lie to you, I'm not the best painter out there. And even looking at these curves, every single try, I'm getting a nice smooth curve. It's not really too difficult. Now, if you've ever used something like the pencil tool, for those of you who are pencil masters, you know what I'm talking about. The pencil tool does not represent somebody who knows how to draw a curve properly. But if you are painting, drawing, illustrating inside Illustrator, and of course, if you're using a tablet and stylus setup, uh, using the paintbrush tool and the pencil tool makes a lot more sense so you can freely create what you want. To make your strokes themselves a lot more smoother and maybe a lot more longer, you can simply edit the properties of any tool that draws. So for example, the paintbrush tool, if I want more of a smoother curve every time I draw, I'm simply gonna double click on the tool and it'll give me my paint tool options. So you have this little slider here at the top, smooth or accurate, and you can adjust between which one you're trying to go for. So I always say, find a happy medium, test out each of these steps, see which ones work best for you, and then that's gonna be your setting. This is purely gonna be based on the setup that you have, the peripherals you use, and whatever sensitivity your device may be set up for. So in this case here, yeah, I'm using a trackpad on my laptop, and I choose smooth, so I'm able to create a lot more smoother off a curve. So even drawing something like a, a heart, that's bad. Let's try that again. It's something simple and straightforward that I can use. Now, even looking at this, using the paintbrush tool itself, if I select this arrow path, you can see quite clearly that it uses a way lot more anchor points than it needs to. To make this part a little bit more easier for me as well, I can redo the simplifying option even on this. And so it goes down from a seven point to six point. And of course, the less points you have, the more smoother of a shape that you're gonna end up getting. So even if you are somebody who's sitting and painting with a paintbrush tool or drawing with a pencil tool, and you still want to reduce the number of anchor points you're generating, go ahead and try out the simplify option that you have available to you here in the path panel. We'll go ahead and repeat that on the right-hand side one again, object menu, path, simplify, and bring that down from six points to about four, and remember at the end of the day, even if the curve is not right, it's kinked a little bit, we can always take our direct selection tool and make further adjustments to it to make it look just right. Now going back to what I showed you earlier on, when I created this brush here, I gave it the option to go ahead and have a color associated with it. And that's simply, because I chose the hue value, I can simply select the object, go to my properties panel, click down here for stroke and choose any color 
that I want to go ahead and apply to it. Uh, so yes, if you're using brushes or anything like that, and you want to have the ability to go ahead and change the colors, all you do is when you're creating a brush, make sure your method here is set to hue shift. That will allow you to change the colors as you like. Cool. So that gives me a little graphic like this that I can use. Now, if you've ever had this problem, as you can see, I'm scaling down. And at the original size, I'm happy with the way it looks. But as I scale this guy down, it still keeps the same thickness. Now, that's basically called scaling of strokes and effects. Uh, depending on how you have uh, Illustrator set up by default, you can toggle this on or off. So if you're somebody who's drawn something or painted something, you want to make it way smaller, but then you end up with that little weird block like so. This is how you can fix it up. Simply make sure nothing's selected, go to your properties panel, and switch on scale strokes and effects. Now, when I decide to scale this object down, even though it has a stroke value right now of one point, as I go smaller, I still keep the thickness in regards to the ratio reducing as well. So now you can see my stroke drop down to 0 0.2. So if you've ever been somebody who's been creating graphics, working with outlines and strokes, and you had to go ahead and scale them down and kept on getting thicker, that's the reason why your scale strokes and effects were off. In some cases, you wanted to be off because you want to maintain the thickness of your stroke regardless of how you scale. And in some cases, when you're designing, you want to switch it on so it scales down based on what you have. Now, this is something I'm obviously going to go ahead and use uh, later on as well. So it's an element that you want to use repeatedly, and that's common, especially if you're working with branded based elements, logos, or whatever sort of graphics in your layouts, you want to create, create uh, design consistency. Uh, one way of doing that is turning that element into a symbol. Now, if you've ever used symbols before, if you've ever seen this palette, most of us is probably call it the clip art palette because you think when you come in here, we've got this little folder, has all these little preset graphics in here that I can use. And, and then we stopped at using that. We compared it to something that Microsoft creates in regards to clip art, but it's actually not that. The symbols palette, apart from the ability to store elements, gives us one major critical factor that makes design work a lot more easy to work with. And that is to create a parent-child relationship where we can have one element used multiple times. And when we want to make changes, we do that just once. Let me show you. I'll go ahead and select this guy, drop it into the symbols panel. Now, if you've ever seen the symbols panel before, or if you've seen it and you got intimidated by all the options, let me tell you what's the two most important things here that you look at. And the rest, you guys will only look at if you're using, for example, Adobe Animate. In regards to Illustrator, you're either choosing between the symbol type, which is dynamic or static. Export type, registration point, even enabling nine guide slicing and stuff. Most of these are all reserved for use in, in Animate later on. So export type, movie clip or graphic will not make a difference to Illustrator. It only factors into using Adobe Animate. And the old name for Adobe Animate was Flash Pope to those day in there. Now, I'm going to go ahead and choose static for this. And, and I'll show you just now in a sec uh, what's the difference between a static symbol and a dynamic symbol. But just to put this into perspective, I'm just going to make a couple of copies of this using my alt key. And again, if I wanted to go in now and decide to change the left-hand side stroke from red to yellow or green, uh, if I did a normal copy, I would have to do it about five times. Now that I have a symbol, I can simply double click on the symbol, get inside, select what I want to talk to, make my adjustment. And when I come out, it applies throughout. So the point is you can have this either on one artboard, multiple artboards, or a thousand artboards on your screen, use the same element multiple times, but control it from one specific area. And you can do what you want to these items here. You can go ahead and scale them down, distort them. They will all follow through. And especially for logos and graphics, where later on you might come in and add additional elements. So if I decide to go ahead and try add a little circle in there, and make that black, that's one additional going out it'll apply to all of them. So in regards to keeping your elements looking the same, this is one cool way to go about doing that. Let's get rid of that and go back to my red stroke there. Another cool thing, uh, and we spoke about this early on when you guys were working with guides, you probably saw, uh, if my reply as well in the chat, that normally guides pull out and they expand the range of your artboard. Now, if you want it to be contracted to only your artboard itself, Simply activate your artboard tool as if you're creating a new page. And when you draw a guide now, 
that will be reserved just for that artboard on its own. But something else that you get, probably didn't know that, is the ability to go ahead and make your own guides from almost anything you want. So let's move this guy off for a second. Let's make it a little bit smaller. All right. And if you have, for example, an area that you're creating a safe zone for, especially for when you're doing digital uh, publishing and stuff, you can't have graphics obviously going to the edge because they will get chopped off on your screen. So maybe creating a, a little safe zone or a margin. Now, if you're familiar with InDesign, we have margins and stuff there. But in Illustrator, we don't. We normally go ahead and draw our own little guides. But if I go ahead and draw a rectangle like so and indicate that this is going to be my safe zone, I can simply select it go to my view menu, go to guides, and choose to make guides. And now that shape that I've drawn, the all four sides is now a guide. It's represented as a guide. When you export it, it will not get exported. It's only part of the, your design view as you're working with it. That's showing you with a square, but you can actually do it to almost anything. If you use your line tools, for example, and draw like a grid like this to create symmetry, right? Again, if we keep it on a screen, we might have the possibility of exporting it, but if I select it, Go to my view menu, go to guides, make guides. That is now a guide that I can use for my layout. And at the end of the day, this will never be exported, but it will remain part and parcel of your Illustrator document for you to use and use again. Now, of course, if you're trying to select your guides for some reason and you can't, they're most probably locked. And through your properties panel and nothing selected, we have a quick shortcut to release that. So if you don't have the keyboard shortcut offhand, do note you are able to do that on the fly over here. And go ahead and get rid of that and go ahead and lock this back into place. Now, when it comes to working with guides and elements, right, uh, there's a couple of cool things that you can do. Earlier on, Nick went ahead and spoke to you guys about repeating transformations. I just want to go through once more with you guys with using symbols in a combination with that. So it gives you a cool little look. So I've got this heart here that I've created right, and I've drawn it, and that's a symbol at the end of the day. Right, and I want to go ahead and create a repeat, uh, a very similar look that you get, for example, if you're trying to design with symmetry or draw elements that are reflected across a particular axis. And the trick to that that I use is actually using the polar grid tool, something that a lot of people rarely use, if they do use it at all. Right, and I'm just going to set up a simple one here where it's going to have one divider and about eight radial dividers. Simple shape like this. Place that in position. And of course, I don't want to interact with it. I need this as a guide. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn this particular one into a guide as well. And because I have my lock guide options on by default, this will get locked on to begin with. I'm gonna take this, position it as a starting point like so. And if you're not familiar with what we're doing here uh, with the rotate tool, you simply select the rotate tool, which gives you the ability to choose any pivot point for something to move around by simply clicking first for where you want it to be and then dragging thereafter to get that transformation point to work. So I'm gonna go ahead and choose the center of the uh, polo grid there and I'm gonna make an adjustment. Now, I can use this grid as a guide for where the next one goes. And of course, to make a copy, I'm gonna hold on the Alt key in order to give me a copy. And to quickly repeat that, we actually go to the object menu, transform, transform again, which as you can see, the keyboard shortcut for that is Command D. And that allows me to make a repeat really quickly. Now, what this allows me to do thereafter is to go ahead and also do something a bit different, and that is using the symbol itself as a repeating item. See, now that I've got that same symbol instance repeated across the object, I can simply double click, go into it. And let's say, for example, I grab something like my brush tool, go back to the brush stroke that I had there, and let's paint a little squiggle like that. Again, oh my God, that's big. Right, let's go ahead and drop that for a stroke size all the way down to get something a little bit more decent there. Uh, let's add something else into that as well. Again, at this point in time, all I'm doing is editing that particular symbol, nothing more. And let's add those elements in. And as soon as I come out of editing the symbol, again, it's been repeated eight times, that's how I can quickly create a repeat like so to work with. So if you're trying to create uh, elements that have some form of symmetry, Use the symbol scenario and use the guide to help you get the positions just right. Something else that you guys work on uh, a lot, right? So symbols is going to make your life a lot more easier. Is obviously the creation of working with graphics and buttons. 
And, and I've got something pre-created here for us. Now, normally when we have an element like this, the requirement to get this out, especially onto your development platforms, is to be able to export these items as PNGs. Now, each of these, as you can see, are states. I have an upstate and an overstate. I've got a text box on each of them. Right. And then, of course, to export, I can either take this, separate this to uh, separate artboards, and then go file, either export as, or choose save for web. And we also have an option that's new called export for screens, which I want to show you guys. But you also notice there's an export selection here. So if you've ever been the person that had to separate your elements to export them, now you can simply have an item selected, choose export selection, and you'll get this dialog box. Now, obviously on the digital side of things, there's a lot of things to realize, especially when it comes to screens that have higher resolution than others. And that illustrated in Adobe have taken care of for us. So if I'm exporting this particular purple rectangle, I have two quick shortcuts here to export the files for iOS and Android presets. So for iOS, I get a one times, two times, three times, and an SVG document. And if I choose Android here, I'll get from LDPI, all the way to triple X at DPI and an SVG file there as well. We get to choose the location for export and how it's going to basically drop it down. Now, if you need other formats, maybe PNG is not something you want to use, you can come back here because these are just presets for you and you can swap between either PNG, PNG 8, JPEG compressed at 100% down to 20%, SVG, or even if you need to as a PDF document, if that's going to suit your needs. If you need more sizes or you need more different formats, you can add a scale on your own and make your adjustments as required all the way down to a point of a custom resolution or a custom width and height if that is a requirement. Now, that's fine if you're doing one at a time, but let's say I wanna get rid of all of these at the same time. And in order to do that or to export all of these, we're gonna actually use the asset export panel. Now, if you can't find this, it's fine. There's a quick little way you can do this. You can simply select all the items you want, and it knows as long as there's no groups, you've got four text layers, you've got four shape layers. Right-click on them and choose Collect for Export. Now, you have two options. If you choose as a single asset, it will represent it as a single image. If you want it to be multiple assets, you go ahead and choose As Multiple Assets, and then you look in this dialog box, and it will have all the graphics that you've created. If need be, you can come into each of them, double click on their names to rename them for whatever reason. So if you wanna state their up or down states, you can adjust those. You can select them all as well and set them to a preset that you wanna export them to. So you can adjust this as you like, make your uh, edits to the name. And once you're happy, simply have them highlighted here by shift selecting, hit the export button, and then of course, choose a location for where you want to go. So I'm just gonna choose my export to my desktop here. And let's choose that, let that export. Okay, 36 files in total. And to quickly have a look at our desktop just to show you guys how the files are organized. You'll see that they are organized based on the number of times in regards to their sizes. Again, this is one times, two times, and three times. And there's all your elements in place here. Cool. So when it comes to exporting elements from outside of Illustrator, especially for digital outputs, you can use the new asset export options here that makes exporting elements a lot more easier, especially for web-based stuff.